Hi there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this and welcome. I'm Larry Erickson. This is the Erickson Report. Uh, and again, as we did last time, just so you know, this is going to be a little bit different format, a little bit more free form, if you will. Uh, I would appreciate uh, any responses as to how you think about this. If you would rather go back to the very, you know, formal, um, more like news desk kind of thing, or um, is this kind of just me rambling on about topics um, more interesting, or at least as interesting as the other? Um, but please do feel free to let me know, uh, as always, um, whoviating.blogspot.com or whoviating at AOL.com uh, is how you can reach me. But um, I'm going to start with a, with a bit of news here uh, that uh, apparently NBC News was the first to report it, although people pretty much, you know, everybody knew it, knew it was happening. They just, somebody to actually say it happened. Never let it be said that Americans cannot achieve goals. One million people in this country have died of COVID. A million deaths from COVID. And it's I actually agreed that that official account is, is an undercount. It's, it's universally acknowledged that there are more. And even though the numbers uh, have been declining, uh, there's still about 360 people dying a day of COVID. That's like something over 2,500 people a week dying of COVID in this country still. The first COVID death in this country, re reported COVID death, was on February 29, 2020. We've had a million deaths since then. Okay. That is an average of somewhere between 12 and 1,300 people a day every day, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year for over two years. And it's still going on. And that's, remember, we, the U.S., have been more deaths of COVID in the U.S. than anywhere else in the world. But uh, still, we're not the whole world. Something six and a quarter, uh, and again, those estimates are really way too low, over six million people. Nearly 3,000 people a day died of COVID and are still dying of COVID. Um, and yes, do I, do I to any degree blame the, the right-wing bozos and jackasses who are going, oh, I ain't going to wear a mask, my freedom. Do I blame them? Yes, I do. People died because of you. Anyway, let's get on from that. Um, doing the show I was, uh, I was trying to decide, you know, some topics. I, I decided these are the, the topics I will talk about, and we'll, we'll see how long I go on about them. Uh, and I kind of had, you know, an idea of what I wanted to do. And then, of course, a, um, several days ago, uh, Politico came along and blew my entire plan apart by, uh, as, as you know, uh, releasing that draft opinion in the case, uh, the Supreme Court case, that's actually called Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization. It's about a Mississippi law that bans abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Um, the standards of the Supreme Court, the, the established uh, standards of the Supreme Court, uh, the precedents say that um, the limit has to be at the point of viability, which is about 24 weeks. Roe said three trimesters, the first 12 weeks, uh, uh, the first 13 weeks, you can't really do restricted at all. The second trimester, you can put some restrictions on it. The third trimester, it could be severely limited. Uh, a few years after, several years after that, in another case called um, Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Massachusetts v. Casey, um, in case, it just should just refer to as Casey, um, in that case, the Supreme Court set the viability standard. They said 24 weeks. The, the idea being that before viability, the state really has no um, interest in, in protecting that fetus because it's not being after viability, after it can survive outside the mother's womb, then you can start saying, yeah, you have an interest in protecting it. So that's where they came up with that notion. Well, now, apparently, in the um, Dobbs case, 
the draft opinion written by Sammy Alico and joined by four other of that uh, making up a filthy five um, are prepared to, they're just going to throw out Roe and Casey entirely. They're going to go entirely. Um, I'm not going to get in really to the legal weeds of this. If you want, I'll, uh, two references I would give to you. One, a guy named David Gans. He's uh, uh, at the uh, Con Constitutional Accountability Center. Um, and he wrote this before the release of this draft. Uh, he wrote on how the 14th Amendment's history, the, its protection of the, of the um, privileges and immunities of American citizens and its guarantee of equal, uh, of equal protection of the laws, how historically that encompasses abortion. Um, there is also a reporter named Jordan Smith. Uh, she's an report, investigative reporter for The Intercept who really just picked apart Alito's lack of logic in, in re reaching the decision. I'm not going to go into those, but if you're watching this on YouTube or if you're watching it on public access, you can watch it on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and do a search on Hoviating, just like my email address, and it'll be there. Uh, because at, at the bottom of that, at the description, I will include links to those two things if you really wanted to get into some of the legalities of this. But uh, I'm going to talk more broadly about it. I admit I have not read the entire 98-page document, okay? So I'm largely relying on the analyses of others. But there was one thing I did notice um, about, about Alito's opinion. I scanned through it, and I, I did notice that he, he went through a history trying to prove that uh, the death of a fetus has been regarded as murder throughout history. Um, many of his cases, however, that he cited, the, the references he cited, refer to homicide, not to murder. And homicide, the definition of homicide, is a volitional act or omission that causes the death of another, which means a, a homicide is not the same as a murder. A homicide can be completely accidental, arise from negligence. It can just be, it doesn't require any intent at all to cause any harm at all. In fact, you can go beyond that. The famous case of Harry Houdini. Now, the story is, at least, that, well, one thing that's true, he used to invite people to punch him as hard as they could in his, in his stomach because he had a way he could tense himself in a way that was extremely difficult to cause him discomfort. And the story is that one time that uh, somebody did it before Houdini was ready for him, before he was prepared, with the result that it burst an inflamed appendix, and that's why Houdini died. Now here, though, you've got a point that not only did this person not intend harm, they actively expected there would be no harm. Yet still, technically, that was homicide. So his attempt to equate homicide with murder is actually a deceitful, deceitful practice. Other people looked at the legacy, the, the, the um, historical value of the legal precedence he cited. I'd like to be able to spend some time looking at the historical precedence he cited to see just how good it was. Beyond that, he also included a, a discredited theory that abortion is actually a racist tool of eugenics intended to kill off blacks. He bizarrely claimed that the costs of medical, I'm quoting him here, the costs of medical care associated with pregnancy and childbirth are covered by insurance, or he got that idea, I have no notion. But central to his argument, was the idea that the only rights that are actually protected under the Constitution are those that are specifically named and those deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. And he made a point of mentioning how the word abortion uh, does not appear in the Constitution anywhere. Uh, quoting, I'm quoting here Mark Joseph Stern, a writer at Slate, uh, that Alito, quoting, disavows the entire line of jurisprudence upon which Roe rests, the existence of unenumerated rights that safeguard individual autonomy from state invasion. In fact, uh, unenumerated rights, as they're called, are specifically referred to in the Constitution. The Ninth Amendment says in full, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. 
And in fact, even the Declaration of Independence referred to it in that, you know, generally, that famous and generally misquoted opening sentence of the second paragraph. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, Alito, perhaps dimly aware of the drastic results that would rise from his own argument, says overturning Roe wouldn't affect other decisions. But interestingly, the ones that he cited were all pre-Roe. And two important ones about civil rights, uh, which came post-Roe, he didn't mention. In fact, he disparaged. The point is, though, if he's actually going to follow his own reasoning, his own logic about this, there are a whole string of Supreme Court decisions which he would have to say were wrongly decided. The most famous Supreme Court decision, perhaps, the one that probably if people only know one, they know, Brown v. Board of Education. This is the one in 1954 that outlawed uh, racial segregation in public schooling. Um, he'd have to say that was decided wrong because racial segregation was, was clearly embedded. Not segregating was clearly not clearly embedded in our nation's history and traditions. In fact, 58 years before, before Brown, and which is, remember, not even a lifetime, 58 years before Brown, in the case Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, the Supreme Court said that racial discrimination, segregation, is entirely constitutional until Brown specifically overturned it. He'd have to say that Brown was decided wrong. Loving v. Virginia, this is a 1967 case that struck down any laws against uh, interracial marriage. Now, he said that that would be safe, but the fact is that um, it wouldn't be by his logic. It wouldn't be because miscegenation, which is what this is called now, mixing of the races, miscegenation laws, while never nationwide, there's never a point at which all states uh, uh, banned interracial marriage, but there were a lot, they were common, and they were of long standing. So we'd have to say that Loving v. Virginia was decided wrong. Griswold v. Connecticut, this is another one besides Loving, that he said, oh, this one's safe. This was in 1965. And it established a right to privacy is inherent in the Constitution. This actually um, was a, about a law in Connecticut that said married couples could not obtain birth control, uh, birth control devices and information to use in their own houses. Seven years later, in the case Eisenstadt v. Baird, that same right on the same basis was extended to unmarried couples. Uh, he'd have to say that that uh, that was wrongly decided. It had to be because because just like abortion doesn't exist in the Constitution, the word privacy doesn't either. There are t these two other cases that are ac actually post Roe, which he actually attacked. Lawrence v. Kansas, that was a 2003 case that struck down laws criminalizing sodomy, basically gay and lesbian sex. Um, just 17 years earlier, in Bowers v. Hardwick, 1986, the Supreme Court upheld a Georgia law saying that a law barring sex between men was constitutional. They can't say that, uh, that striking down sodomy or that allowing sodomy was well established in our traditions. Obergefell v. Hodges, this is the one that struck down laws banning uh, uh, um, uh, same-sex marriage. Um, the, uh, the court found that the fundamental rights found in the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause extend to certain personal choices central to individual dignity and autonomy. And in doing that, it referred to Griswold. It referred to Griswold. So if you're going to say Obergefell uh, v. Hodges was decided wrong, you have to say that um, the Griswold was. He has no choice. He's trying to avoid facing the facts, but he can't. Um, in fact, if, if he wanted to get out of some of this, in the case of like a Loving and Griswold and, and Brown saying, well, uh, but, but by now that has become so well established that you want to leave them alone, um, then you should consider the, uh, how well the right to abortion is established in, in our culture and traditions. Consider it. Uh, 
Gallup poll from last May, 80% of the American public think abortion should be legal in many or all cases. The Marquette poll from September last year, voters oppose overturning Roe by a 30-point margin. The Washington Post from past November, by roughly a two-to-one margin, uphold Roe and oppose the Texas law banning abortion after six weeks. 75% in that poll said the decision should be left to the woman and her doctor. That included 95% of Democrats, 81% of independents, and a majority even of Republicans. Fox News from last this past December, nearly two-thirds want Roe to remain the law of the land, including, again, a majority of Democrats, Republicans, and independents. Um, from January, the CNN poll, nearly 70% said keep Roe. 85% of Democrats, 72% of, of independents, and, and like, like about half of Republicans. And in that same poll, a majority said that if Roe were to be overturned, they wanted their states to have laws that were more permissive rather than more restrictive of abortion, and actually said that their state should become a safe haven for women seeking abortions who couldn't get them elsewhere. In fact, that, that thing is actually happening in some places. Connecticut has already passed a law related to that. California has a, has a law that is passing through the legislature now that would reject any out-of-state court judgments uh, in, that had anything to do with, uh, uh, re, with um, punishing parents because they supported their uh, gender-affirming care for their children, and that arrest warrants based on those, uh, those court decisions in another state would be the lowest priority for California law enforcement. Lawmakers in Minnesota and New York are, are engaging in, uh, in proposals based on that California law. Democrats in 16 other states plan to introduce those uh, such laws when their legislatures come back in session. Now, not all of those laws are going to pass, but the fact is, there are people playing offense, not just defense, with regard to protection of women's rights. And, and because don't tell me, don't tell me, as, as the right wing often tries to do, that these laws, they're about protecting women's health. They're all, they're protecting women. They're protecting women's health. Don't give me that. Pregnancy carries a greater risk of death than an abortion does. Abortions have, have less than a half a death per 100,000 procedures. Okay. Live births have 20.1 deaths per 100,000 procedures. That means you are nearly 46 times more likely to die from pregnancy and childbirth than you are from an abortion. A recent study of conservative estimates said that um, overturning Roe would increase the annual number of pregnancy-related deaths by 21% and 33% 30, among non-Hispanic black women. But the fact is, Sammy Alito and the rest of the Filthy Five, they don't care. The very first article I read about this draft opinion um, said that it, 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 it ended this way, that this is the end of the draft. Quoting here, the Constitution does not prohibit the citizens of each state from regulating or prohibiting abortion. Roe and Casey arrogated that authority. We now overrule those decisions and return that authority to the people and their elected representatives. And the first time I read that, my immediate reaction to this is that this is not a legal statement. This is not a constitutional analysis. This is a political statement. This is an ideological statement. This is a manifesto. This is not about women's health. This is not about the Constitution. This is about their own narrow-minded bigotry. They ignore the history. They ignore the internal contradictions in their arguments. They ignore the undeniable damage they would do to women's health and lives, the women who would die. They ignore the financial, uh, the, the damage to women's financial standing would do. They ignore the cherry picking of when the principle is important and when it's not. They just know they want it and they want it now. So they are prepared for the first time in U.S. history. Now, Alito had a whole bunch of a list of things where the Supreme Court had overturned previous decisions. But in the relevant cases, those were where the Supreme Court overturned a decision that denied the existence of a right. Here, for the first time in history, they are prepared to strip away a right that has been founded. It's not, they're not looking for a legal or a constitutional end. 
they're looking to pursue their misogynist, twisted, bigoted version of who we, of who we as a people should be. And don't say this won't continue. Don't say the right wing won't push this further. They already have, even before this came out. On March 30th, a woman in Texas was indicted uh, after she miscarried and then allegedly told staff that she had tried to induce, her, uh, induce an abortion. They turned her into the cops. She was indicted for murder for intentionally and knowingly causing the death of an individual by self-induced abortion. And only after this became national news did the prosecutor drop charges committing there actually was no crime here. Now, leading anti-abortionists and allies in Congress are actively planning a national strategy for a nationwide ban on the procedure if the goppers manage to retake power in Washington. Meanwhile, and it's already members of Congress that are doing this. Um, Senator Marsha Blackburn, Marsha Blaggard, opposes the Griswold settlement that, again, f found it's the whole idea that there is a right to privacy in the Constitution. She called that constitutionally unsound. Senator John Conyers called Obergefell. It wasn't a decision or ruling. It was an edict. Senator Mike Braun said that many civil rights decisions of the past 70 years were wrongly decided, a usurpation of states' rights. And when asked if that included Loving for Virginia, he said yes. When asked again if he meant Loving for Virginia, he said yes. He said this basically three times. Later on, he said, I misunderstood the question. No, actually, he misunderstood how much guts he actually had. And they're already going after birth control. They're already going after birth control. And one of the ways they're doing this, they're not going to take away your birth control pills, not yet. What they're trying to do, however, is to blur the line between birth control and abortion like they blurred the line between abortion and murder. Um, all right, look, that's, that, uh, that's enough time on that. I, I, I've already taken more time than I needed to or wanted to. So I'm going to try to cover something else very quickly in about half the time that I thought. I'll just mention this, in fact, and I'll, and I'll leave it. Um, in mid-April, I saw two news articles, uh, one from AP, one from NPR, uh, talking about inflation and how the dramatic issue of inflation and the record inflation, all the rest of that. Um, between the two articles, they talked about, you know, the supply chain. They talked about un low unemployment driving up the cost of labor. They talked about a whole bunch of things. Between the two articles, they had 40 graphs, um, you know, paragraphs, 40 graphs. Over 2,000 words between the two articles and not a single, single mention of corporate profit as a driver of inflation. This is despite the fact that data from the U.S. Commerce Department's uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis says that corporate profit margins are now the largest they have been in over 70 years. Pre-tax profits for the whole year of 20, uh, 2021 were up 25% over the year before. Um, over the last two quarters, the last half of 2021, they were up 37% from the year before. And in fact, in their, corporations know this. In their earnings reports, various corporations have bragged about how they've managed to stay ahead of inflation, how they've been managed to jack up their prices more than their costs and so increase their profits. In fact, in March, an executive at a company that owns a bunch of Applebee's uh, sent an email to other um, other uh, executives talking about how the inflation and gas prices and other things would be a boon for the company because it would force more people to work more hours and accept a lower rate of pay in order to do it because they needed the money that badly. As former Labor Secretary Robert Reich put it, mega corporations could easily absorb the higher costs. They're not raising prices because they have to, they're raising them because they can. The problem is corporate greed. Meanwhile, this is happening at a time when a record, a record 23% of Americans who've died over the last five years died with an estate valued at less than zero. The bottom 50% of Americans now collectively have a net worth of less than nothing. A record 44% of U.S. workers are in low-wage jobs. You know, in the 19, as recently as the 1950s, half of all household wealth in the United States was held by the middle class. Now it's just 17%. 
And according to the world, uh, the World Inequality Report, the return of top wealth inequality over across the world has been particularly dramatic in the United States. And they went out of the way to point out this is not the result of economic factors. This is the result of policy decisions. The wealth gap between America's richest and poorest has more, more than doubled between, 19, between 1989 and 2016. In 1989, the richest 5% of families have had 114 times as much wealth as families in the second quintile, that's second from the bottom. By 2016, it was 248 times as much. All right, I have to stop there because I have something. I'm, I'm probably going to go back to this next week because there's more, more to say about this. Um, and I'll get back to it and get to other news. But I want to finish up with something here. Um, I'm approaching the second anniversary of my wife's death. And she was a, um, a leader in a local community. Uh, we have a resident-owned community. It's a, um, in the old days, it would have been called a trailer park. It's actually manufactured homes. Um, but we own it as a group. We collectively own it. And she was a leader in getting that done and in helping it happen. And then in leading it in the years. From, from, from the day we started until the day she died, she was a leader in making that community and building it and bringing all the improvements that has been seen over these past 10 years plus that we've been the owners. Uh, Rock USA, which uh, is a leader in, in uh, this kind of move, honored my wife, Donna, with a memorial bench in her name. And we just installed that a couple of days ago. And um, I'm just going to end by thanking Rock for that. And um, this is the bench for you. Peace.